Rock and roll music is another phase of the changes that come over this passing scene. The Northwest music and radio scene has always been important. We have exclusive, informal interviews with many of the foundation players in this story. Some made it big, some stayed in the garage, but they all had fun. Local neighborhood kids that were part of something big. I'm Gary Crow, and this is the history of Northwest rock and roll. Musician, songwriter, rock and roller, teen idol, and lover of life. He's been around the block a time or two through his journey upon planet Earth, or the rainbow planet as he refers to it. Let's take a look at his part in the history of Northwest rock and roll. Jim Valley. First you hold your hand and I give you that way I smile. I wanna hug and kiss you, but baby got to wait a while, while, while. Oh, oh, oh. There was a Baptist church that from my uh, grandparents on my dad's side that I loved that music, trombones, trumpets. No tambourines, but very close. Really up spirited. It was the first time I really felt I really loved music. In the fourth grade, I took uh, trumpet and wanted to be Harry James, Louis Armstrong. Um, played in a, a group we called the Moonlighters when I was in about eighth grade. And when I was in the ninth grade, we played at our junior high school, Jane Addams. Uh, variety show and they brought in a, a special act from Shoreline High School which was a group called the Frantics and that's the first time I saw rock and roll played and my eyes sort of spun around like Mr. Toad and said I, I think I want to do that. I was in a, a little uh, blue uh, satin vest and a little blue bow tie and playing the trumpet sitting down like Glenn Miller and they came out with their guitar and stand up bass and work with me Annie honky tonk and it was just incredible. I mean, the audience loved it. And I went back, you know, later and I said, well, do you guys need a trumpet player? Uh, talk to me later, kid. I was in a, a, a choir and then we had a these three girls that wrote songs, played, all played the piano, I mean, four, five rock and roll chords. I used to go to the rehearsals and, and, you know, listen to them and how they put these songs together and they showed me how to play these chords and one of the girls became my girlfriend and I wrote a song for her. Well, oh, Cassandra. And so my next door neighbor, who was going to high school, said, that's a great song. He said, I, I know a... I know a guy that got a set of drums for Christmas, and I know a, a guy that plays a saxophone great, and I know a, a guy that has a guitar in his house. He can't play it, but he has a guitar, and he went, let's, great. So they brought him over, and we, we had our first rehearsal. The guitar player that wasn't a guitar player, that had, he sort of beat on it, and we learned three songs, and it was so incredible playing music you didn't have to read. We played our first little job, which was an intermission at a, Junior high, junior high school sock hop in Lake City. And uh, we played these three songs and I realized we were missing something. So I went down and bought a, a guitar and an amplifier. So my first guitar was uh, called a Dan Electro. And aqua blue, I think it was $115. You got a $40 amp. And and it was cool, you know, you could turn it up, learn how to play a couple strings, and down, 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 down. Learned how to play basically by myself, Dwayne Eddy Records. You got a month free lessons if you bought a guitar in those days. Said, nope, I'm gonna go home and learn how to play like Elvis. And uh, I probably would have amounted to a maybe a different kind of guitar player. And within about six or seven months, I uh, opted to go for a Stratocaster, which in those days was uh, around 230 bucks. My dad signed for it. I was on a $15 a month payment plan. I used to sleep with it. I mean, it was beautiful. 
And then at one point we decided to go with Vince Valley and the Viceroy's because that sort of sounded good together. And then after a while I didn't want my name associated with the group so we dropped the Vince Valley. Uh, at one point early on there, that 1958, our family moved north of Seattle, Shoreline. And uh, so that's where I found uh, Al Berry, who became our piano player. And then I, then I became the guitar player. And uh, uh, another guy that, was, that I met there said, my mom will buy me an electric bass if you'll teach me how to play. So I said, no problem. Four strings on the bottom. And I think in June, May of that year, of my sophomore year in college, we, that we played a three-hour dance. Um, Fifty-five dollars, I think we got. So we, we you know, we uh, we would learn uh, songs sometimes from the hit parade, a lot of R and B kind of things, but we'd learn songs that some of the other bands would play, like the Frantics or Dave Lewis Combo. For me in those days, it was always something that would maybe help work my way through college. I didn't con consider myself enough of a, of a musician that that it would be a, that I would do it for, for my life. It's just something. It was fun. It was something that was a spare job. The way we met girls, where we met other people at dances, and it was a something. That's what we did on the weekend. So eventually, we would play Friday and Saturday night every weekend, all the way through high school basically around Seattle. We played PTA dances, club dances. In those days, they had uh, high school fraternities, high school sororities, social clubs, cool stuff. And so uh, my social calendar, uh, you'd meet people from all different schools. So that's how we got jobs. Well, Jimmy Valley has a band. They're uh, $90. Spanish Castle and Parker's Ballroom were two dance halls from the 30s that were incredible, big, giant venues that all the bands would love to play at. You had to have a hit record, basically, to play there. The dance circuit um, included Target Ballroom, Linwood Roller Skating Rink. All these places had these giant dances. Spanish Castle just happened to be between Seattle and Tacoma. And it seemed like there was a little bit rougher crowd there. Pat O'Day was one of the main disc jockeys, along with Dick Curtis. They were the ones that started the radio dances. The first radio dance they had, I believe they hired the Whalers with Tall Cool One at the Spanish Castle. Pat O'Day, Dick Curtis. So they were heavyweights. Uh, they made each dance on the radio sound like it was the greatest dance in the history of the world. If you weren't there, you were going to miss it. Every dance sounded that way. I mean, if you could hear some of the old dance promos that they, uh, they produced with Dick Curtis and, and uh, Pat O'Day were, were just amazing. Monday night, attention east side, Lake Hills Roller Rink. The Viceroy's return to Lake Hills. The Viceroy's are finally back to Lake Hills Roller Rink. It's a Monday night dance you can't miss. This is Seattle's number one on request station, KJR, request line number 4219290. World's Fair. We got a job on, on an ocean liner that was moored at, in Seattle. And Channel 11 had their studios there and they had a show called Deck Dance. So we were like the live band. It was the best gig in Seattle was, you know, a half hour every afternoon. We played an hour, they filmed a half hour. And uh, we met people like Nat King Cole, people come on that, that were going into uh, the Seattle Center or the World's Fair. And because of that, we played a song that Al had written, Al Berry, called Granny's Pad. And we got letters, we got lots of fan letters. Why don't you record that? So the band said, okay, Jim, you're the leader. See if you can get us a contract. So our contract was that we paid the record company $500. That, that took care of a recording session, mono. I don't even think it was two track. And uh, 545. And so we recorded this song, 
We never really thought it would get played. We thought it was sort of a cool song, but it had a sound. It didn't have a sound like a popular music sound, a Northwest sound as, as it became to be known. And um, <clears throat> in those days there, on the radio, there was a battle of the new sounds, some of these radio stations. So um, Granny's Pad got on one night, and it won, and it kept winning, and it won for, I think, days or a week, and they finally, Pat O'Day charted it, I think it got to number three. And at that time, it was the largest selling local record in the Northwest. Granny's Pad was what, what kept the Viceroy's in work for years. The turning point in, in, in my career with the Viceroy's uh, we had an audition down in San Francisco at the uh, Peppermint Tree, and Paul Revere and the Raiders set that audition up for us, so I got the contact. And that job down there uh, uh, was just a whole different ball of wax. Uh, it would be like the Beatles going to uh, uh, Germany, to Hamburg. I mean, here was um, a rock and roll down there, life between beatniks and hippies, right in between where it all started. And my world got turned around, changed around, sort of an inward path. And uh, at that point, I decided that the Viceroy's weren't where I, where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a little bit more out there and open and maybe a little bit more funky, more, more three chord rock and roll. When I came back from uh, San Francisco, I was gonna move in a different direction. And that's when I saw on the good times for the first time at Parker's. And uh, I was amazed at their energy, very solid, solid beat. Fred was more of a intricate, you know, kind of moving around a lot, different things he's hitting, but Bob Holden was <laughs> and made you want to dance, just, you know. Um, anyway, they came up to me and they said, well, we're looking for a guitar player that could sing. And I said, well, I'll keep my, my ears and eyes open for you. and. Uh, that night going home, I couldn't sleep, you know, I was tossing and turning and finally I went, I'm the guitar player that sings. So I called up Don Gallucci the next day and said, I found you a guitar player that sings. Who is it? And I said, it's me. You'd leave the Viceroy's to join Don the Good Times? I said, you bet. And I think we would be a really, really, you know, I said, you're a hot group already. I think what I could do with your lead singer, Don McKinney, I think we would be dynamite. And it was true. So I, I left the Viceroy's. They thought I'd made the wrong choice. Um, joined on the good times. Within a month, we went in to record for Jerry Denon. and they didn't have a song that I thought was hot. So I wrote a song one night called Little Sally Tees. We recorded it sort of like a Wooly Bully, Righteous Brothers answer back and forth between McKinney and myself. And it became a giant hit and established us as the, you know, we were like, I believe the top rock and roll band in the, in the Northwest. At that point, I felt that this band would be my career. It really felt like a career rather than playing dances uh, on the weekends. We got a manager at one point. We played Lloyd Thaxton, we played Hollywood a go go. Anyway, we felt that we were on a roll. From the go capital of the world, Big Hollywood. When we were down there recording in LA, uh, Revere called me up one day and asked me to join them. And we had a meeting, and I said, you know, I love this group. I think we're going to make it. You know, I'd like to come from a certain point and go all the way up into national recognition. He says, you know, that, that happens once, you know, in a, a blue moon. There's a lot of groups that are this far away from making it. Most of them never do. And he says, we have, you know, we're on, we're the action. It's Columbia Records, you know, we're in fan magazines. You know, sound studios want to do a movie with us, and we'd like you to be part of that. So... About a week later, he says, think it over. A week later, I talked to the group, talked to myself, talked to the trees, decided to go for it. 
And then, as it turned out, I came into L.A., whatever day it was, and was picked up, taken to where they were filming where the action is. Kicks had just come out. I stayed with Mark Lindsay. He was, you know, we were roommates for a couple months. And uh, it was exciting, you know, just being with them. We were supposed to have a rehearsal for our first tour. And it kept being they were too busy. You know, they were doing the dating game, and they were doing this or that. So at one point, um, I would get together with Fang, the bass player, Phil Volk, and we'd sort of learn these steps and learn a few of the songs. And uh, as it worked out, they were they were going to play in a we were going to Hawaii for three days. And they weren't going to take me because, you know, they didn't need me over there. But then as it turned out, that would be the place where we would rehearse. So at the last minute, I get to go to Hawaii, which was exciting. We get there, they're still busy. We don't rehearse. We come back to uh, L.A. Um, our, our tour, it was a Dick Clark tour with Gary Lewis and the Playboys and whoever else, uh, starts in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We still don't rehearse. We get to this place. We have, I think it was 45 minutes before the show started, that would be our rehearsal. So I, I was full of, you know, positive energy. I had no problem. I thought, you know, no problem. So um, what happened was that uh, we rehearsed these songs. You know, they were fairly nervous about it. When we got out there to, to, uh, for the performance, it was very smooth. I, I, I hung on these pipes that were in front of the uh, stage for a solo for Louie Louie, and they said, no problem, the guy's got it. You know, so from then on, it was, it was easy, easy singing. Here they are, Paul Revere and the Raiders. Paul Revere created an incredible feeling on stage that made everyone comfortable, everyone could be themselves. And he was cracking jokes and doing funny things in back of the, you know, with the, where the audience wouldn't see. But we, we were just, you know, we were, we were like the Marx Brothers. And uh, I think that because I, you know, loved the music that it came out. And, and when I was with them, they became the number one group in, in uh, the U.S. There were three things that took our time. One was where the action is, which was early in the morning, 7.30 to like 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Then you go home and rest for a couple hours, then you go to Columbia Studios and record with Terry Melcher, which was also an incredible experience, because he had recorded the birds with Turn, Turn, Turn and Tambourine Man, and was really responsible for the Raiders sound. And then there was uh, touring, which took a lot of time. And then there was fan magazines, and that took a, a lot of time. I mean, you'd, you'd have you'd be on these photo shoots and interviews. You know, seemed like two or three times a week. Mainly, we toured with bus tours, but we'd have a bus with bunks on it. We'd fly to different places. We basically played a half hour, sometimes forty-five minutes, mostly a half hour at the end of a show. Uh, the concerts had five, six, seven acts on them. So we, it was very, it was a piece of cake. I mean, compared to Don, the good times where you were driving for hours and you played a three hour dance, you know, it was be, really being like royalty. And the way you were treated by disc jockeys and other folks in the, in the industry. In the Raiders, with, with the dream coming true of being like a rock and roll star in, in a top group, uh, I think when one dream comes through, then another dream replaces it. So I was meeting people uh, in that year, 66, 67, um, Jackson Brown, some of the mamas and papas, um, different people that are really singing with their heart, writing sort, sort of more melodic, beautiful, magical kind of songs. And so, and then the Beatles are bringing everyone through a lot of different steps. I was seeing and hearing uh, music songwriters uh, that kind of turned my crank as a songwriter. I was supposed to have some songs on some of the Raiders' recordings, 
And as it turned out, I didn't, so that was sort of like a, a turning point. Um, also, I had the, I had the uh, feeling or a dream of doing sort of like fairy tales for kids songs that would, wouldn't have necessarily an evil element, but would, would help kids feel good about themselves, which later evolved into the work I do called Rainbow Planet, helping kids uh, with friendship and social skills and so on. But anyway, with, uh, with Paul Revere and the Raiders, it got to be a point where it felt like we were in one place and I, I, I wanted to move on. It came time for me to leave that group. just one chapter in our history of Northwest Rock and Roll series. Join us for more great stories as we continue our look at the history of Northwest Rock and Roll.